Welcome to the What Really Happened radio show. The history the government hopes you never learn. Here is your host, Michael Rivero. And aloha, America. Welcome to our show today. It is Friday, January 22nd, 2016. Thank goodness it's Friday. Thank goodness it's Friday. Thank goodness it's Friday. We have a lot of stuff to talk about today. The phone lines are open, 877-300-7645. Tom is sitting our, uh, in our control room. Rented lips. In our control room, ready to answer the phone when you call on in. And joining us in hour number three today will be the lovely Lady Claire with her unique perspective on the world. And we always have a lot of fun, obviously, when she comes on in here. All right, getting into the news. Turkey is preparing a ground invasion of Syria. And uh, I guess they're going to go on in and try and rescue what's left of ISIS, or at least that part of it that was uh, bringing the uh, stolen Syrian oil across the border. So that situation's beginning to uh, escalate. Now, Russia has managed to deliver additional relief aid to those blocked Syrian cities. The Western media is trying to claim that Assad is starving these people. No, these are areas that are blockaded by ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and the rest of uh, these U.S.-backed terror groups. Now, there's a major upset taking place because a video has surfaced of Turkish forces firing on Kurdish civilians waving white flags while they were trying to tend to people who were wounded. And it was caught on video. It's gone viral around the world. This is a war crime. This is obviously a war crime. But at this point, Erdogan doesn't seem to care, or his sponsors in the West. Now, this month marks 25 years the U.S. has been at war in Iraq, going all the way back to Desert Storm that was sold to you with that hoax about stolen Kuwaiti incubators, and it turned out it never happened, it was created by public relations firm Hill and Knowlton. Uh, the, the lady who claimed to be a Kuwaiti nurse that was on TV and crying was actually the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador. It was another lie to trick you into supporting a war. 25 years now, quarter of a century and a lot of people are dying. Talking about civilians, there have been 55,000 civilian casualties in Iraq between January 1st of 2014 and October 31st of 2015. And that's um, 88, uh, 18,000 civilians killed and another 36,000 wounded. This is from the United Nations. And, you know, numbers of casualties and wounded are always fuzzy. And I remember that the American people didn't find out how many young kids had been killed in Vietnam until after it was all over. Then they started saying, well, it was a little worse than we were telling you. The fog of war and so forth. The U.S. has announced they're going to be sending boots on the ground into Iraq to fight ISIS, honest and for true. They're going to go into the cities of Mosul and Raqqa and get there ahead of the Iraq forces, because the Iraq forces are actually winning against ISIS, and that cannot be allowed to happen. So the U.S. is still playing this game that ISIS is our enemy, really, cross our hearts and hope to lose the election. And they're still playing that game, and we all know it's a hoax and a fraud. ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all these groups were manufactured and supported by the United States as proxies to redraw the map of the Middle East. Declassified official U.S. government documents have confirmed that. Down in Yemen, along with Saudi Arabia, the uh, Yemenites are being attacked by U.S., British, and Israeli warplanes that are continuing to bomb the place into rubble. Because by golly, once you are conquered and have a U.S. puppet ruler, you stay that way. You don't dare kick out your puppet rulers. See, there's a growing trend. And one of the reasons I think the U.S. hates Iran so much, is Iran set the precedent. Because in 1979, Iran succeeded in kicking out their U.S. puppet ruler, the Shah, who had been running Iran for the benefit of Western corporations since the CIA coup d'etat against Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953. And the Shah had a long run, but eventually the Iranian people got sick and tired of him, and they kicked him out. And that's something that the U.S. empire can't tolerate this idea that they may be kicked out of countries that they have taken over, even though it does happen on a regular basis. Now, as you know, no sooner had 
the uh, IAEA confirmed that Iran was in compliance with the P5 plus 1 and forcing the United States to drop those sanctions despite the obvious attempted provocation of those two Navy boats going into Iranian waters. The U.S. has slapped brand new sanctions on Iran, claiming that two tests of ballistic missiles by Iran violate Security Council resolutions. The claim is these rockets are capable of delivering nuclear weapons, even though Iran doesn't have any and isn't building any. Now, a rocket is a rocket is a rocket. Any rocket with enough lifting force can hoist a nuclear weapon if you put the proper brackets in it. But it doesn't mean Iran has done that. It's just another excuse to try and provoke a confrontation with Iran to put new sanctions on there. And they're still out there, you know, pushing the propaganda up in Davos. Uh, Secretary of State John Kerry is out there saying, oh, we know Iran was moving toward producing nuclear weapons. We absolutely know that. Really? Where's your proof, John? And why aren't you talking about Israel, which already has hundreds of nuclear weapons, refuses to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, refuses IAEA inspections, and was caught trying to sell a clandestine nuclear weapon to the former government of South Africa. The very activity the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is supposed to prevent. Kind of a little double standard going on in Washington, D.C. Now, Russia has announced that their Navy is going to hold drills with China, Egypt, and India this year. And it's another indication that Egypt and certainly India are starting to pull away from the U.S. sphere of influence. Because the U.S. is an empire clearly in decline, and everybody wants to line up with the potential winners. Over in Ukraine, Kiev's troops have opened mortar fire at Donetsk western suburb. Again, they are firing on civilian territory. That's a war crime. The Donbass militia reports there have been shellings of of the unrecognized Luhansk Republic. Poroshenko is just ignoring the Minsk agreements, ignoring the ceasefire. And Kiev has come up with a rather clever, they think, way to get out of their $3 billion bill for natural gas to Russia. Kiev is fining Russia's Gazprom for $3.4 billion, claiming that the main pipelines on the territory of Ukraine by Gazprom constitute a monopoly. And so they are going to fine Russia for $3.4 billion, then they'll give $3 billion of it back and their bill is paid. At least that's what they think. But it's very obviously a panic move because Kiev can't actually pay that natural gas bill. And as we're seeing on the East Coast right now, this is going to be a rough winter before we're out of it. And a lot of people are going to be really, really hurting. There's something like 80 towns uh, in the southern part of Ukraine that don't have electricity because of the heavy snow snapping wires. So it's going to be very, very rough. Now, somebody had an article over at Blacklisted News, Why America Allows Saudi Arabia to Get Away with Blatant Human Rights Abuses. And the article goes on about how the U.S. is dependent on Saudi Arabia oil. Well, it isn't really. The U.S. has enough oil for its own needs on its own territory, even without the fracking. But what's going on here is the U.S. needs Saudi Arabia to go on selling their oil only for the U.S. dollar. And Saudi Arabia has been getting buddy-buddy with China recently. But more importantly, Saudi Arabia is part of the petrodollar deal. Saudi Arabia has invested much of their fabulous oil wealth back in the United States of America. Private investment into corporations, buying of treasury bonds. And they can ask for that money back anytime they want. And that's why the U.S., you know, it's just hands off on Saudi Arabia. Because Saudi Arabia holds the mortgage. We'll be right back. And Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here. Now, down in Great Britain, as you know, they're coming up on their referendum as to whether Great Britain wants to fully merge with the European Union. The connection is kind of tenuous so far. Or split off completely and go their own way. The Brexit. And public opinion is very much in favor of breaking off. They're looking at the European Union. They're looking how all the people in Europe are suffering under the privations of the European Central Bank. They're seeing that refugee crisis, which appears to be manufactured, all the trouble that that's causing, and they want to get out. David Cameron is obviously in league with the globalists. He's trying to uh, support 
fully merging Great Britain with the European Union to the point where he has issued gag orders on his own government not to say anything negative about merging with the European Union. But that's not stopped other people from speaking out. Sir Michael Caine came out publicly saying that it's time for Great Britain to leave the European Union because Britain should not be dictated to by faceless civil servants, and apparently his fan base just went wild in support. So probably what David Cameron's going to have to do is get the people he had count that Scottish independence referendum vote, get them on down to London to count the vote for the uh, 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 EU referendum, because otherwise Britain is going to be an independent nation very, very soon. Over in Spain, they're, they're, they're dealing with a little bit of chaos. Uh, last month they had elections that didn't really produce a clear majority. And so King Philippe VI... Uh, asked the uh, incumbent Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy to just go ahead and form a new government, and Rajoy has turned him down, much to a lot of people's surprise. He decided uh, it wasn't uh, 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 the kitchen was too hot for him. All right, we're going to go ahead and grab a phone call from Nate in North Carolina. Nate, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Nate, are you there? Nate, are you there? You there. Oh, there we go. Oh, no, he just hang up. All right, well, be that way. See if I care. Down at the University of South Florida, the student body has passed an Israeli divestment resolution calling on the board of trustees uh, to stop all or to uh, withdraw all their investments in companies supporting Israel's crimes against humanity in the occupied territories, including Caterpillar, Hewlett Packard, G4S, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman. And once again, we're out there seeing Israel on one hand saying BDS is having no effect whatsoever, and then anytime somebody else signs on to BDS, they start screaming, you're a Jew hater, you're an anti-Semite, you want Hitler to come back and gas Jewish babies in the ovens, what's wrong with you people? You're, we're supposed to have all your money. It says so in the Talmud. Now, speaking of the Talmud, uh, the National Labor Relations Board has dismissed a case brought by this Israeli group against a U.S. trade union for supporting Palestinian rights. Now, this is getting to be a tactic by Israel, where any time a group comes out saying the Palestinians have rights, we need to be be taking care of it, they'll gin up some kind of a lawsuit. They call it lawfare, in order to bankrupt the target by dragging them through court. So... Last October, Sharat Hadin filed a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board against the United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers of America, who voted to back BDS. And the National Labor Relations Board threw the case out as a clear violation of Americans' First Amendment right to be critical of any government, including our own. Now, getting into the economy, obviously we had a happy ending for our Friday starting with very obvious interventions in the Asian markets uh, overnight, and everybody had a really good Friday. The Dow ended uh, 210 into the green, so everybody's kind of relaxed for the weekend. Uh, But we're not out of the woods yet, and we're hearing confirmation from no less than J.P. Morgan that the old wisdom of the trend is my friend isn't working anymore. People are selling the rallies, and they're not buying the dips anymore. So the uh, conventional wisdom on how to manipulate the market is beginning to break down, primarily because everybody knows the market is being manipulated. All right, we're going to try and talk to Nate in North Carolina again. Nate, are you there? Yes, sir. Thank Finally, you, we got you here. Yeah. Um, look, uh, I was monitoring uh, enemy transmissions uh, yesterday evening, uh, specifically NBC Nightly News with mm-hmm. Lester Holt. And, mm-hmm. uh, he, uh, apparently, uh, they have bitten on the regurgitation of the, um, drama concerning the poisoning of Litvinenko. Yeah. And, um, I knew that you covered that, uh, and I couldn't remember. Did you say that, uh, his former employer was implicated in that? Well, there's a lot of evidence pointing in a lot of directions. And first of all, the fact that, uh, Great Britain undertook this investigation 10 years after the fact and then said Putin probably authorized it without any supporting evidence. It's another propaganda attack on Russia. 
Bad Russia, okay. bad Russia. But you need to remember this guy was killed with polonium-210, which is a very painful, agonizing form of death, and it is a pattern we have seen with the Mossad. They used it against Yasser Arafat. And, you know, Great, Great Britain itself had far more motive to go after this guy than Russia did. This is just plain old-fashioned Russia bashing again. Yes, exactly. And uh, even Paul Craig Roberts came out. Did you see that? Well, yeah, you, this was on your website. That's right. Tell us nothing but lies. Yeah. That's right. In which his, his own brother and father said that they are sure that the Russian authorities were not involved. Yes. Well, just so, like the family of Martin Luther King came out and said there was a conspiracy and James Earl Ray is innocent. Oh, those King family, they just want fame, they want attention, they want money. Pay no attention to them. You will only listen to the official government story. I mean, exactly. how many times do we have to go through that same exercise before we begin to realize that Paul Craig Roberts is right? Government lies to us about absolutely everything. In fact, they don't dare tell us the truth even once out of fear we might learn how to tell the difference. Yes, we can't have any double plus on good thoughts out there. Absolutely. Well, you know, my thoughts are triple plus on good right now these days. Okay? Okay, thanks, Mike. All right, we're going to let you go. Mario Draghi is out there saying, well, you know, it looks like the economy has changed a little bit, and the ECB is signaling their equivalent of quantitative easing is probably going to start in March. More instant money to pour all over the financial industry to make it look healthy. And, of course, anytime any central bank starts creating new money out of thin air to save their fellow bankers and brokers and financial wizards, it steals the value of the money you have already worked for and put in your pocket, in your bank account, in the mayonnaise jar buried out behind the pineapple plantation. They are literally, effectively stealing from you to keep themselves rich. Just something you need to keep in mind when you wonder why the rich are getting richer and you, no matter how hard you work, keep getting poorer. We'll be right back. Hi, America. Welcome back to the show here. We're talking about the economy. Now, you have probably heard or read the term wealth effect many times over the last several years. And basically, it's the idea that if you stimulate the stock market and drive the prices up, everybody is magically richer. Another way to put it is they're going to take the money and shake it back and forth real hard and hope that it grows. But it's an illusion because the stocks are overvalued. Wealth effect is going to move wealth around. It doesn't create new wealth. It's all an illusion. And so probably it should not come as a surprise that more than half of the wealth effect created gains from the 2011 lows to the 2015 highs have already been lost to the tune of $17 trillion, with a T, dollars. You need to understand that modern banking and finance is not a science. It's a religion. It's an arbitrary set of rules that you are brainwashed into believing are real that allows for the systematic and constant transfer of your real wealth from your hands and your labor to the pockets of the bankers. We all need to be private central banker heretics. We need to refuse to believe that this is the way the world is supposed to be. All right, we're going to go ahead and grab a phone call from Mandy in New York. Aloha, Mandy. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hi, Mike. Um, uh, this was just a comment I wanted to make about yesterday's discussion uh, regarding the political correctness. Yes. And, um, I mean, I understand completely where people from Western nations, I mean, I'm an American myself, but the people of European ancestry, I get where they're coming from feeling that, you know, they're losing their identity and all of that. But uh, the conversation turned kind of ugly when it started talking about people's IQs and things like that. Um, as a person of color myself, um, I just felt like, uh, how can I put this? Do, do we also get the opportunity to be not politically correct as well? Like, can we say that it's not, People yeah, like sure us. you can. Sure, sure you can. Uh, you know, I mean, how, how many, how, how, how many times? Listen, Mandy, how many times yeah. have you looked at an NBA championship basketball team and said, you know, there aren't enough white players in there? Yeah. Okay. You know. But my point. Uh, I'm sorry, Mike. I just uh, the conversation that I see happening online the past couple of months, the past year, has been so 
you know, it's becoming really ugly. There's, there's nationalism and then it, nationalism eventually becomes racism. You know what I mean? And, uh, for example, the elites that are running, running the show in the, in the Western nations. Yeah. And, part, and know, they botched it up. I mean, they botched it up. No. They they actually right. thought they were going to take all these different groups of people, different cultures, different races, and different religions, and jam them all in a single blender to make a common herd of workers. And they thought we were all going to, you know, uh, encircle arms and, and, and around the campfire and sing Kumbaya. And it's clearly not working. Right. And again, it, go, it goes back to this idea. The entire liberal political theory rests on this idea that humans are born with a totally blank mind and everything that we are is a result of our environment. And that's all based on Margaret Mead's book, Coming of Age in Samoa, which has been exposed as an intellectual hoax. It's a fraud. The, the foundation for liberalism, uh, it, it doesn't work. People are going to be people because, you know, we're not shaped entirely by our environment. It's a blend between our inherited uh, qualities and our life experience is what shapes us as individuals. And we are individuals. We don't fit into these little cookie cutter outlines that political correctness wants us to fit into. Right, but that's the thing though. It, it turns into collective generalizing on the right as well. You know, and I'm not, I don't consider myself a liberal or, or a conservative. I'm not, you know, I, I see that when you hold on to an ideology, you know, it, it blinds you. So I, I'm not either or. I agree with some things on the right and some things on the left. But I guess my point is, um, again, I can call out the left all day. They absolutely have their Well, let's, let's take it out of left versus right paradigm here, and I'll tell you where all of this fell apart. My personal approach to people I meet is to basically take them one at a time on a case-by-case basis. Some I like, some I don't like. Some are very smart, some are kind of dumb. Okay? And that's just the, that's the real world. Okay? Now, uh, like I said before, all men are created equal is great politics, but when it started becoming political agenda, the government decided that rather than guarantee equality of opportunity to everybody, which is a good thing, they would mandate equality of outcome. And that's where we got, you know, affirmative action and, uh, you know, and, and race-based, quota-based hiring and all the rest of it, which has been very, very destructive of our society and uh, the economy as well. And there, you know, government... Uh, agenda is what came out with this idea of generalizing across an entire group of people saying that we're going to tell this company they have to hire 15 people who are black on the assumption that those, those 15 black people are going to be qualified for the job. And they aren't. I think Carly Fiorina, if anything, proved hiring on the basis of race and gender is not necessarily a good thing because they hired her in there on the basis that she was a woman and they wanted to be politically correct and they almost lost their their, their company. Uh, when uh, Barack Obama was running for president in 2008, with all these people, it's time for America to have a black president. Well, we got a black president, and with it, we got Obamacare and NSA spying, endless wars, and an economy that's hovering and trembling at the edge of the precipice. Now they're trying to say, you should vote for Hillary because it's time we had a woman president. No, I want to go back to a meritocracy. I want the best person in that job, and I don't care what gender they are, what color they are, what religion they are, what, ge- what orientation. I don't care. I want the best person who can actually do the job in there. And anything else is somebody who's less qualified trying to politic their way into that top seat. I, I absolutely agree. And just one other point I wanted to make when it started to get into the the IQ and all that, uh, it seems to be more geared toward the, the Middle Easterners are the ones that are being targeted at this point. I, I know a lot of Middle Eastern people, they take their education very seriously. Yes, there they are do. a lot of doctors, a lot of um, Yes, they do. Yes. Doing, you know, computer technology careers and things like that. So I just hope that everybody, that, that's political correctness, and then it, it can get to, uh, you know, that's anti-PC, and then it can get on both sides to a point where it's it becomes, you know, it becomes insulting. You know what I mean? And I just hope that people realize that. You know? Well, I'm, I'm sure that they do, but the, the the best way to get away from political correctness, which is a form of cultural Marxism, is to do what I do. Everybody you meet is a brand new experience, and you just learn about them, and you take it from there. Uh, but as you yourself point out, different groups of people have different abilities, and there are some that have a gift at technology. There are some that have a gift at uh, farming. There are some that have a gift at uh, uh, building things. I mean, when New York was starting to build skyscrapers, they had all these Native Americans working on those high iron crews because they had a superior sense of balance and they weren't falling off the girders the way other people were. And so it is a reality that we all do have differences between ourselves and each other, 
And anybody who says otherwise, they're not dealing in the real world. That's a good point. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mike. All right. Yep. We're going to let you go then. Coming up in a commercial break, George Soros is out there flapping his gums one more time, saying he's shorting the Standard & Poor's 500 and says China is likely to have a hard landing. And then he's saying what everybody else has been saying for the last two weeks. The Federal Reserve hike was a mistake. And even when they did it, everybody said this is a political move to say the economy is recovering, going into an election year, and it has blown up in their face big time. Now, getting on back to Europe and the refugee crisis, the IMF has actually come out recommending to Europe that refugees be paid below the minimum wage. See, the refugees are a source of really cheap labor for the factories and the farms, which is good for the owners of the factories and farms. But it is amazing how blind the money junkies are, because if you are not paying your workers a decent wage and salary, they will not be going down to the shopping malls to buy whatever it is that you're selling. Even with the new trend of forcing people to buy things they don't want or need, the money just isn't there. We'll be right back. And aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. We're talking about the economy, and right now, wealth inequality is a problem. And no, it is not the poor people envious of the rich. It's just common sense that for an economy to continue to function, as money is taken out of the top of that pyramid, it must be recycled back down to the bottom in decent wages and salaries so that workers can go back to the shopping malls, buy things, and pour that wealth back in to keep the cycle going. And under fascism, that recycling mechanism goes away, which is why no fascist empire has ever survived very long. Right now, the world's richest 62 people have as much wealth as the rest of the planet. And here's the problem with that. Those 62 people, there aren't enough of them to go around to all the shopping malls and grocery stores and gardening stores and hardware stores and buy up all the necessary items to keep the manufacturers going. There aren't enough hours in the day. There aren't enough of them. And that's the part that we're missing. That recycling, getting the wealth back down to the people so they can pour it back into the system and keep it running. Now, over at J.P. Morgan Chase & Company, Jamie Dimon is smiling. His uh, pay compensation package has been boosted 35% to $27 million. Now, the compensation practices of J.P. Morgan are tying a lot of that package to future performance, money coming in. The problem is that that money coming in might not be from earnings, could be from bailouts, which means you're picking up that tab here. There's an article we put up at whatreallyhappened.com, 12 trigger events that could unleash economic collapse in the U.S. These are the 12 top points of vulnerability. I'm not going to go down the list here on the air. But I do recommend you go to whatreallyhappened.com and look for this article and read the list. Because there's a lot of things. Some of them are going to surprise you. You're not, you, you wouldn't have thought these were points of vulnerability, but they are. All righty. Now, earlier in the show, when we were talking about Saudi Arabia's human rights violations and why the U.S. turns a blind eye, we were talking about this article that said, well, the U.S. is dependent on Saudi Arabia's oil. No, the U.S. is dependent on Saudi Arabia selling their oil to everybody for the U.S. dollar. But the other hidden part is the fact that Saudi Arabia, as part of the petrodollar deal, has invested a huge amount of that oil wealth back into the United States of America, buying treasury bonds and direct investment into U.S. companies, financial institutions. And the reality is, that if the U.S. were to anger the Saudi royal family enough, they're going to start asking for that money back. And that could crash the U.S. economy. Saudi Arabia could start selling their oil for another currency. That would crash the economy. And by the way, these are all legal things for Saudi Arabia to do. They could refuse to roll over their investments. When the, the term of investment comes up, they're just going to say, okay, time's up. Send it all back. A real-life version of the movie Rollover. According to the IMF, Venezuela's inflation is now above 700% per year. 
completely, completely out of control. Now, up in Davos, where the money junkies are having a real party, one of the topics of conversation is that America is pretty much obsolete. It's a dying empire. It's dying of its own internal corruptions, its mismanagement, its endless wars. The parallels between the current United States and ancient Rome, or for that matter, the former Soviet Union, cannot be ignored anymore. Now, of course, in Davos, they're pushing for global corporate government and the New World Order. But we know the United States is in trouble. Even the New York Times came out with an editorial. America's best days may be behind it. And it does seem to be true. We can't do a lot of what we used to do. Haven't been to the moon since the 1960s. We have to hitch rides on the, on the Russian rockets to get our people up to the space station. All around we see our infrastructure collapsing. Much of the technology we enjoy in our lives isn't made in America anymore. And much of it has grown so complex we can't even manage it effectively any longer. Now, Rome's empire was built on their development of some new technologies, including concrete, roads, aqueducts, all kinds of wonderful things. But as Rome began to succumb to accumulating debt, they lost the ability to maintain their technology. And that accelerated the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. We're seeing the same thing happen today with our IT infrastructure. Everybody's out there gouging it for as much money as they can get right now. Products are sold into the marketplace that are known to be faulty. And they leave it up to the end user to find out what's wrong. And then when you send in a report, nothing gets done about it anyway. If we can't maintain our complicated global computer network, there's going to be some real problems down the road. The crash of the Roman Empire triggered the Dark Ages. The crash of the American Empire could trigger a new Dark Ages. All right, let's talk about the uh, candidates and the campaign, because there's a lot of stuff going on out there. The outsiders are in. Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders are in the lead in the latest poll in Iowa. Sanders is ahead of Clinton in New Hampshire 2-1, to one, according to uh, Manchester TV Channel 9 and CNN. And people are uh, out there saying it's obvious Sanders isn't the underdog any longer. And Hillary Clinton's campaign is taking the tack of, well, you may think Sanders is better than Hillary Clinton, but if Sanders is the nominee, he is going to lose. There's no way he could win the general election. You have to go with somebody who can win the general election, and that's Hillary Clinton. That's nonsense. If Hillary can't win against Sanders, she can't win against anybody. Except Ted Cruz. She wants to run against Ted Cruz. She can roll all over him. But they're getting a little hysterical and shrill over there at the Clinton campaign. In the area of the undecideds, they're pointing out that uh, you, you, this, this election, one in ten Americans who plan to cast about this election, this will be their first election. And they're young people and they're coming on in. And the undecideds or the lost voters are saying they're liking Trump. Now, here's the real surprise, despite all the screams about Trump being racist and Trump being anti-Mexican and everything. Down in Florida, Trump is polling above 50% of GOP Hispanic voters. They understand that Trump's issue is not with Hispanics, but with illegal immigrants. And by the way, legal Hispanic immigrants don't like being made to look bad because they get lumped in with the illegal immigrants and how bad they behave. So it's not that surprising. Up in Davos, one of the top topics of conversation there is how alarmed they are that Trump could actually be president of the United States of America. Soros doesn't want to have that. Powers that be there, they're all lined up against him. They're saying that Trump is an embarrassment. He's, he, we, he's, he's, he's not one of us. He's not a... You know, and they're scared because he's going to upset this little game they've had going for decades of their little social, their little clique, the socias, just passing off the White House back and forth among each other. 
never allowing an outsider in. Like Again, look what they did to Ron Paul in 2008 and 2012. Trump could actually do it. And we're already starting to see the signs of a major anti-incumbency fever sweeping the nation. Debbie Wasserman Schultz and John McCain are actually facing serious challenges in their re-elections this year. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Every once in a while, it's time to take our capital city, Washington, D.C., stand it up on edge, whack it a few times over the sewage drain, put it back down, and let some new people in there. I think that would be a good thing. I especially would like to see everybody voted out of office who calls themselves a friend to Israel. Because no government can serve two masters. And a government that serves Israel does not serve the United States. We'll be right back. Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. And uh, this is hour number two. The phone lines are open, 877-300-7645. And we're going to go ahead and uh, take a phone call before we get back into the politics. Andrew in New York, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Oh, hey, Mike. I'm going to talk about the human cause global warming propaganda. It's kind of really annoying that you and I must get frustrated with this propaganda. They're trying to say that 2015 is the warmest year on the work, like on history or like on record. Yes, but uh, we're not allowed to look at the data by which they came to that uh, that conclusion. I mean, they 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 fought Congress tooth and nail. Uh, they were fighting Judicial Watch tooth and nail. And anybody who understands scientific method realizes that's a red warning flag that NASA and NOAA are being told by the government, you will support the global warming agenda because without a carbon tax, the government's going to run out of money. Um, is it true like, that the sun has the, the biggest influence like with climate? Like, is there something that human beings cannot control? Oh, absolutely. The sun is the dominant control of climate on Earth. And it's rather ridiculous to see all these carbon Nazis running around saying, oh, no, no, the sun's got nothing to do with it. It's all human activity. Nature is in perfect, stable balance, and only humans are upsetting. And that's, that's nonsense. The balance of nature sounds good. It's a very pleasant expression. It is absolutely not true. Nature is chaos. Nature is change. The climate has always changed. It always will change. It was changing long before humans got here. It'll go on changing long after humans are gone. That's the reality there. And we know that the sun is going into a period of uh, decreased activity and energy, uh, repeat of the maunder minimum, and everybody on the East Coast is getting a taste of that right now. W- uh, winter was a little slow in starting because of the El Nino current, which is caused by undersea volcanoes, but it has definitely arrived. Um, doesn't, like, volcanoes or, like, animal activity, like, um, omit more uh, carbon than human activity does. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but the uh, the global warming cult has this pet theory that all of the naturally produced carbon is balanced by something else, and it's only the human contribution that is tipping the scales into chaos. I mean, it's absolute, complete, and utter nonsense. And again, we're all making fun of the carbon Nazis because back in 2000 they were saying snowfalls are now a thing of the past. Tell that to all those people on the eastern seaboard right now. Okay. And the last thing, the last thing I'm gonna make um is that the people who believe in global warming, they act like um if you don't like believe in this agenda, they act like you're against like renewable or alternative energies, you're like for fossil fuels or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, if you don't go along with their religion, oh you must be in the pay of the oil companies and you must be this and you must be that and you now they 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 can't debate the issue on its scientific merit because there is none. Anyway, Andrew, thank you for the phone call. We're going to let you go. I've got a bunch of stuff to cover before uh, the Lady Claire joins us next hour. Now, the National Review has gone on the war path against Donald Trump. And they had a special get rid of Trump issue with 22 leading conservative lights just bashing Donald Trump as hard as they could. And it was so over the top and biased that the GOP has been forced to drop National Review from debate sponsorship because under the rules of the GOP party, sponsors of the debates are supposed to remain neutral and not express a bias for or against anybody. And National Review just went way over the top. They're uh, they're talking about it on Fox News right now. Trump must be stopped. Trump must be stopped. He's got his own money. He can't be bought. He won't do what the bankers tell him to do. 
He's his own man, and we can't have somebody who's their own man in the White House. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. They're afraid of him. They're so afraid of him, I'll tell you right now. If Hillary Clinton does become the Democratic uh, candidate, uh, I'm expecting the GOP, they'll, they'd rather let Hillary win than let Donald Trump into the White House. They are that terrified of him. Meanwhile, getting on to Hillary, article coming out of Activist Post, who does the Hillary Clinton piper play for? Obviously, Wall Street. With the removing of limits of campaign donations coming from large corporations, all the politicians, they don't even bother raising money from people like you. They'll, they'll go through the motions, but they know the big checks are coming in from Wall Street, and Wall Street's darling is Hillary Clinton. And certainly based on the past history of Bill Clinton and Hillary herself, they're going to go where the money's going to go. But there is a new cloud on Hillary's horizon. Okay? There is a report from Catherine Herridge that the FBI was able to recover deleted emails from the hard drives of Hillary's private email server. The disk wipe was not done to what you would call professional standards. I mean, you don't suppose she just hit delete and thought that was the end of it, but apparently the FBI is recovering a lot of what Hillary deleted off of her own server. And Hillary's camp is still out there trying to insist that when she got the mails, they weren't classified. It's not how it works, especially with the special access program intelligence that is classified the instant it's created. It never exists unclassified. So she's lying to us again here. Story coming out of no less than the Wall Street Journal. A criminal charge is justified against Hillary Clinton. And, of of course, what is really making life complicated for her is that email that surfaced in the last dump on New Year's Eve where Hillary Clinton is instructing one of her subordinates to erase the classification marks on a document so it could be sent to her on a non-secure device. That right there is a felony. Now, there's something else a lot of people are missing. When you are dealing with classified documents for the government, there are very strict rules including what you are supposed to do when you stop being in government employment. You have to return those documents or certified they have been destroyed. And yet we know they were still on Hillary's server right up to the moment that uh, Trey Gowdy started asking for them. That's a violation. Hillary is in violation of 15 sections of Title 18. At least two of them are felonies. The former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates is out there saying the odds are pretty high that Russia, China, and Iran got into Hillary's server. And those were the uninvited guests. There's still that other issue that the government and the corporate media don't want to look at, but it's starting to go viral around the net. More and more people are starting to ask this. Was Hillary selling foreign access to classified information on her private server? and collecting the payments and laundering them through her so-called charitable foundation. We know the Clintons did that back in 1996. This is a question that must be asked. It is a question that demands an answer. Now, there's another story over usblastingnews.com. When will Hillary Clinton be indicted? And the question they have is that, you know, she could be indicted Before she locks up the nomination, in which case she's just out, Bernie Sanders is going to be the nominee. The second scenario is that she achieves the Democratic nomination and then is indicted. Now, technically, she can still run for president under indictment. I doubt she would win. If she's convicted, she's out of the presidential race. Convicted felons are not allowed to sit in the White House. But they're looking at the possibility that if Hillary becomes the nominee and then the indictment forces her out, The Democratic National Convention will be brokered. They'll just pick who they want to run. Apparently, Hillary Clinton showed up for a speech uh, in Iowa. The fans had waited for hours for her, and she talked for less than five minutes and then walked out the door. 
Good way to get the votes in Iowa there, Hillary. We'll be right back. Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here. And even Fox News is covering this statement by former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates that Hillary's server had to be targeted because the Pentagon gets 100,000 intrusion attempts every single day. And yes, they know the Pentagon is there. Not everybody knew about Hillary's private server, but anybody who's trying to figure things out, it wasn't all that well hid. And Hillary's server had weaker security than the Ashley Madison website. You remember what an embarrassment that was. There was at least one totally open port into Hillary's server. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, the polls are showing that Sanders is ahead of Hillary in Iowa. They're about a week away from their caucuses. Uh, Sanders is enjoying a two-to-one margin over Hillary up in New Hampshire. And everybody's saying, you know, what are the Democrats going to do? Oh, my goodness, you know. They, Debbie Wasserman Schultz promised that Hillary was going to be the president. What are they going to do? Well, uh, there's a very enlightening article over at Op-Ed News talking about the superdelegates. Now, the superdelegates were something that was invented following Richard Nixon's re-election campaign. Uh, when he ran against George McGovern, which everybody knew George McGovern was not going to be able to be a significant challenge to Richard Nixon. And in that interval of time between Nixon's victory and their realizing that Nixon had sabotaged all the other Democratic candidates so that he could run against George McGovern, they invented the concept of the superdelegates. These are delegates attached to the party. They are not chosen by any voters. And they are allowed to go for whatever candidate they personally want to go for. Unlike the state delegates who are at least under a moral obligation to vote for the candidate that won that state. <clears throat> and the superdelegates carry about 20% of the voting power in the nomination of a Democratic presidential candidate. So there's speculation that if Bernie Sanders wins in Iowa and New Hampshire, the Democratic National Committee is are going to use those superdelegates to basically shift 20% of the numbers back to Hillary Clinton because Debbie Wasserman Schultz has already told the superdelegates, you will vote for Hillary. And Debbie is under a tremendous amount of fire from the Democratic Party over this because the attitude being displayed clearly is we don't care what the Democratic voters want. We want our person in there, and you will like it. They're still thrashing around this Ted Cruz, natural-born citizen issue, and all of the arguments coming out of the Cruz campaign right now are variations on the theme of, well, that may have been okay back when the Constitution was written, but it's a modern world, and we have a right to change it or ignore it, and blah, 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 blah. No, you don't. The only way you're allowed to change the natural-born requirement for the President of the United States of America is with a constitutional amendment passed by Congress, signed by the President, and then ratified by three-quarters of the states. And even then, it would not apply to Ted Cruz because that would violate the ex post facto provision of the Constitution. Every argument saying that Ted Cruz can run for President is basically coming out of a position of, we don't care what the Constitution says. We want what we want. And these people who are so ready to set the Constitution and the Bill of Rights aside to get their candidate in office are going to be really caught up short when they realize that Constitution and the Bill of Rights was the only thing protecting them from abusive government. That's why it's there. The Constitution wasn't written to tell the government what it can do. It was written to tell the government what it can't relative to the people. And you can't be selective about it. Natural born was defined in the laws of the day as born inside the country. And everybody's saying, oh, anybody pushing natural born, you're just being racist. You, you, you don't want this Cuban person in there. No, I, I want a president who is going to play by the rules because we have had way too many presidents in recent history who think the Constitution is an interference and a problem to be gotten around. Remember what George W. Bush said about it? Blankety blank piece of paper. That's a very dangerous attitude. That's the doorway to dictatorship. And Bush was joking about it. 
You know, things would be a lot easier if this was a dictatorship, as long as I'm the dictator. (laughs) Very funny, George. We're not laughing. Another issue is surfacing regarding Ted Cruz. This was over in the NewAmerican.com pointing out that Ted Cruz's closest counselors are all neocons. They're recycling the neocons back to Ted Cruz's campaign. And we know the neocons are very pro-war, pro-Israel, and actually that's it. That's their entire agenda, pro-war and pro-Israel. So let's talk a little bit about the migration crisis. It is getting out of hand. The French Prime Minister Manuel Valls is saying this can destroy Europe. They're already losing their Schengen borderless society. Uh, The refugees are placing a huge strain on the economies of these European nations that are already in serious trouble because of the European Central Bank. Over in Calais, the migrants went on a rampage and literally burned their own camp down. In the process, a journalist for Russia Today was attacked by knife. These migrants are not presenting a positive image of themselves to support the idea that they're going to be allowed to stay. Over in Italy... Poor Italians are homeless, living on the streets in tents. The refugees are being given new buildings to live in. Does that sound like wise, prudent government? Article out of Der Spiegel, no less. Germany stretched to the limit. Have they lost control? Because they're talking about how the police literally cannot deal with the out-of-control migrants, starting with Cologne on New Year's Eve. They don't have the resources to keep these mobs under control. Another story coming out of Russia Insider, speculating that Angela Merkel, who only a little while ago was declared the world's most powerful woman, according to Time magazine, appears to be on her way out. The German media has turned on her because of this open borders policy. New world order globalists, we're all, we're going to let everybody into every country and just hug each other and Make cookies and toast marshmallows over the fire or something like that. Okay. Uh, Apparently, Barack Obama sent a letter up to the governor of Oregon demanding swift action against the protesters who are protesting. They've uh, gone into that uh, wildlife refuge building that was empty. Nobody got hurt. And a lot of people are saying this could turn into another Waco. We'll be right back. Oh, hi, America. Welcome back to our show here. We're going to go ahead and grab ourselves a phone call. Elizabeth in Connecticut. Aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Thank you, Michael. Um, I called in yesterday, and uh, I just noticed there's really not a lot of female voices that call in, so I thought I might. Well, we're going to have lots of female voice in the next hour, so stay tuned. Oh, cool. I know. Your wife is so awesome. Yes, she is. Um, so I want to touch on, you were talking about immigration again, and I think this is right now the major danger um, for our people. But I want to talk about what Trump said about the Muslim community having to speak up about the, you know, what they know, or if they're really truly American, in other words, they want to integrate, they need to basically tell the authorities if they see something fishy. And I totally agree with them on that. Um, because they're allowing people to uh, represent them um, in that way, whether it's a false flag or not, I don't know. But well, here let's let's step let's step back one point. I, the the issue here isn't immigration in and of itself, because immigration is a fact of life. But every nation has a right to decide who gets to come in and who does not and how they're going to behave once they get here. Now, I find myself in agreement with President Theodore Roosevelt, who said, if you're going to come here, learn our language, learn our rules, learn to live the way that we do. And that's just common courtesy. Now, many, many years ago, I I had the opportunity to do some work in Europe, primarily in uh, Germany and Italy, and I had the little recorder plugged into my ear, and I was learning as much Italian and German as I could, so I didn't go in there like the ugly American demanding everybody speak English, although everybody did. <laughs> but they, they respected right. the fact that I made the effort to be part of their 
you know, world rather than trying to drag my world in here. Uh, a lot of people in the United States are very angry with the uh, illegal immigrants who are coming across the border and then saying, we're going to set up a new version of what we had back home here. And we need, we need to have signs in Spanish and we need to have Spanish textbooks in the school and everything. And a lot of people dig in their heels at that because they don't want to throw away their life and culture to make room for somebody who's coming on in and, and acting very rudely. The same thing is going on over there in Europe, where you have some of these mm-hmm. uh, refugees and these marches saying, you know, we want this to be a Muslim country. And it, 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 it's just, it's disrespectful. You know, when you go right. into somebody else's country to stand up and say, we want you to change uh, to be the way that we are. Uh, you know, that's the attitude of an invading army, not of refugees. I want to put a point out there, and, and that's about American immigration, because in the 1965 Immigration Act, which was pushed by these cultural Marxists, by the way, that's when the flood began from non-European countries. And I and I do think that it is important to kind of research that. Um, but the, the Muslim thing that I was talking about is more of kind of a, a um, shadow of the big Jewish people, Zionists, and the little Jews. The big Jews always seem to push around the little ones, yes. the, the, the powerless ones, and they make them into victims. Um, it's time for a lot more voices from the Jewish community, the, the, you know, the regular Jews, the regular walking public Jews, to speak up against their Zionist leaders. It's really I, I agree, and it's long overdue. Unfortunately, it is part of their religion that you do not criticize a fellow Jew in public. You know, that's like, you know, the, the 12th or 13th commandment. And it, it does inhibit people from speaking out. And where they really need to speak out, though, is against this idea that Israel represents all the world's Jewish people. Because Israel is trying to use all the world's Jewish people as a shield for its political crimes and its actions. And they are, you're absolutely right. They're setting these people up to be victims in the backlash. And then Israel will start the cycle all over again. Oh, we're, you know, it was another Holocaust. You know, we're being abused. We're being discriminated against. It's another pogrom. It's another expulsion. They've been playing that game for 2,000 years. It gets tiresome. So also, did you, I don't know if you touched on the National Review Online in there. It's oh, yeah. horrible. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was just amazing. Well, I have two names to say out. One is the guy that called after me yesterday. He spoke about Jared Taylor. Um, I've just been studying these people. Um, he's not a very good spokesman for what you might call pro-European people. Um, he speaks pretty derogatory, and, and I would not be going there. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, on the other hand, a researcher who can be pretty pointed, but he passed away. He can be pretty pointed, but he's much more, he's much less sneaky. William Pierce does, does some really great work. Um, and then, uh, instead of Jared Taylor, David Duke, who I think you interviewed. Yeah, well, I've had him on the show. He's a pretty good activist. He's a pretty good activist. Yes. Um, and then the last point is language. Um, there's, language is a really strong and powerful way of shaping people's minds. And the Zionists and elites and the New World Order people are really, really good at that. Um, for instance, the term anti-Semitism or homophobic or Islamophobic. These are all pretty... New terms. I think anti-Semitism is the oldest one from like the late 1800s. Yeah, but what, but what they do is they'll establish a term as having one meaning and get everybody using it. Then they start to change the meaning. Now, when anti-Semitism was first coined, it meant people who hated Semites just because they were Semites, which applied not only to Jews but also to Arabs who are Semitic. Okay, but isn't over that a, isn't that a language term? The well, language yeah. Term. Well, it's from it's from Shem from the Noah story, the descendants of Shem. Okay. Uh, but over time, of course, anti-Semite has now been uh, redefined to mean anybody who's critical of the government of Israel. And mm-hmm. it's not it, the governments of Israel's uh, ethnicity or religion that's the problem. It's their behavior. It's how they act that's the problem. And trying to say we can't criticize Israel's actions uh, because it's anti-Semitism is like trying to say we shouldn't criticize what Hitler did because it's being anti-German. And it's when when you shift it like that, reducto ad absurdum, you realize just how silly it is. Mhm. Yeah. Well, it's a critical time. In a way, it's a really great time to be alive. I think. Well, I'll, I'll push it again. And I know. Um, I mean, I think Bernie Sanders would be a disaster to this country. But um, 
Better than Hillary, I guess. Yeah, any, anybody but Hillary. Anybody but Hillary. If Godzilla was running against Hillary, the lizard would get my vote. Elizabeth, God will let you go. Thank you very much. We're running out of time here. And I do want to get into human-caused global warming because it is a mess over there on the East Coast. Massive blizzard warnings for Washington, D.C., Baltimore, winter storm Jonas. They're calling it crippling. They're calling it epic. Roughly one in every four Americans in 20 states are underneath a blizzard warning or a winter storm watch or a winter storm warning or freezing warnings. It is monstrous. Over in Washington, D.C., they've shut down the metro, subway, and bus lines. This is the first time they have done that in the transit system's 40-year history. They just shut it all down. They're saying, we're not even going to try and get anything out there. Uh, a lot of commuters are stranded, They're stuck in the snow. They don't know how to deal with it because Al Gore told us we were never going to see this stuff again. State of Pennsylvania has declared a state of emergency preemptively just to be ready for what's coming on in. Charlottesville is saying this is probably going to be a record snow event, all-time record snow. Same thing in D.C., Baltimore. Could it eclipse historic snowstorm totals? Yeah, very possibly. United Airlines has shut down their operations from Washington, D.C. to New York City. The planes are all grounded. They're in the hangars. Everybody is hunkering down. The stores are, are empty. Everybody, and it's a good thing. Water, food, everything, batteries, hunkering down in their home. And it's not just uh, the East Coast. China is getting hit with a record cold snap. Temperatures dropping to minus 30 degrees. Schools have been closed. Everybody has been sent back home. It is going to be a mess. All right, we're going to take a commercial break, then we're going to come on back. We're going to continue with human-caused global warming and heading to the top of the hour and the lovely Lady Claire. Hello, hi, America. Welcome back to the show. Now, the U.S. Department of State is facing a January 29th deadline to release the next batch of 55,000 pages of Clinton's email to the Congressional Committee looking into the email server and Benghazi. The State Department has now asked for a one-month postponement to the end of February because of this horrible snowstorm coming on down. Really, look at all the snow. It's going to be another month before we can do it. This storm is going to be over by next week. It's going to be over by the original January 29th deadline. It's just another excuse to stall, 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 stall to protect Hillary. Now, we tend to rag more or less on the promoters of human-caused global warming because we've caught them lying. And frankly, their behavior is far from what we would consider to be professional scientific demeanor. Now, recently, there was a geologist, Dr. Bob Carter, who passed away, and he was a, a skeptic of human-caused global warming. So, pro-warmist scientist William Connolly w literally went public saying, you know, the death of Bob Carter is an advancement in science. Science advances one funeral at a time. And, of course, the, everybody's in shock over this guy just celebrating the fact that one of his critics has passed away. And even if you feel that privately, you don't go public with it. Talk about childish behavior, and that unfortunately has become the hallmark of many of the supporters of the global warming hoax. They want what they want. They don't care what the science says. They don't care what people says. They want you to believe like they're telling you to believe. Because Obama needs that carbon tax, or the government is broke. But there is a problem when you hit the people with another tax. And by the way, this year, okay, you will spend more of your money on taxes than on your housing, food, and clothing put together already. When people get hit with another tax, there's something else they have to not get. You're not getting more money out of the population because we've run out. It's just everybody's grabbing and hoping they can get to what, left, what little is left before the other party. 
But there's no magic endless supply of money out here. We're not allowed to just create it out of thin air the way the private central bankers are. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot of denial going on in Washington, D.C. and Wall Street. They, they want to believe that there's still vast pools of untapped wealth out there in the hinterland. They just have to figure out a way to grab it and all will be well. No, not going to happen. Private central banks were designed intentionally to draw all of the real wealth out of the general population and put it in the pockets of the bankers, and nobody came up with a plan of what to do when they succeeded and the system started to lock up, which is what's going on now. Now, over at Google, which enjoys a very close and special relationship with the United States government, including the NSA, apparently Google forked out a whopping $16 million lobbying the U.S. government last year for changes to the law, for advantages, for special privileges. What's really interesting, there's an article over in NewsForge.com on how six senators have basically just admitted they really don't know anything about the Internet at all. And this gets on to this issue about how the government is saying that uh, ISPs ought to provide broadband into American homes that's at least the equal of the broadband that is available in other countries, like Japan, where broadband over there is about ten times faster than the best that you can get here in the U.S. And, of course, the ISPs don't want to do that. They don't want to spend the money because they want the money for bonuses and the rest of it. So there's this big fight going on. So there was this letter signed by six senators who are out there making these very absurd statements about why do you need all this very high bandwidth when Netflix says you only need this much. And it's absurd because, first of all, most of us are not actually getting the bandwidth our plan specifies. Most of us getting broadband into the home, it's not just one user. There's the mother's computer, the father's computer, there's the digital TV, there's kids on their little devices watching Netflix. It, and doing what else? And these guys are clueless, and we seem to have a real problem with that. We have a government of permanent professional politicians who are trying to manage things they don't know anything about. Now, when our country was started, being in the government was a part-time honorary position. That's the origin of this practice of Congress is in session, then it's not in session. Because originally, the members of Congress had to go back and do their regular jobs. Look at the Founding Fathers. We had one lawyer, Thomas Jefferson. Ben Franklin was a publisher and inventor. Paul Revere was a silversmith. George Washington ran a plantation. Josiah Bartlett was a doctor. These were all people who knew how to do things in the real world. And they brought that awareness and understanding and wisdom into the halls of Congress with them. We don't have that anymore. Very few members of Congress have ever had other jobs than being in politics. Those that have turn out to be really spectacularly good, like Dr. Ron Paul. But we're in an age of multi-generational political families like the Bushes and the Clintons. They've never done anything other than politics and grabbing the money. And they expect us to trust them that they're going to come up with the best way to manage technologies about which they're completely, utterly clueless. Big mistake. All right, we're going to grab ourselves a phone call. Jim in New Jersey, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hey, Mike. Uh, I, just wanted to res I just wanted to respond back to the, the lady that called earlier. Uh, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an American, and, uh, you know, it just turns out that I, that I do have family members that are Muslim, you know? Okay. And, uh, like, I did something earlier for Christmas, and what I did was, like, uh, went to the veteran shelter to, like, uh, you know, make some food for the guys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of the requests were, were, you know, halal food and stuff like that. So it means that a lot of these guys are Muslims, you know, but I know that they're proud Americans. So No, they're nice people you know, overall. I mean, you, you know, yeah, I, I've never met a Muslim I didn't get along great with. They're very pleasant, very polite. And, you know, you just, just show yeah. respect to each other and everything's going to be fine. But we're American, we, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, we're Americans first, you know, like, uh, we've, like, this is, a, we love, we love, this is our country, so it's, it's tough to hear all this stuff on the news, you know, about, uh, banning all Muslims, especially since the religion doesn't have, like, a, 
Like a, well, you see, here's yeah, here's where all here, here's where all the demonization of Muslims as part of the war on terror has come back to bite the new world order, because they have been right. feeding us all this stuff about Muslims did 9/11 and Muslims did this and Muslims did that, and then all of a sudden they're 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 scratching their head and trying to figure out why people don't want this flood of Muslim refugees pouring into their country. And it's almost like they had this attitude that they could tell us to hate Muslims a couple of years ago, and we would do it, which too many people did. And then today they could say, love the Muslims, and we would just flip around and go with it. You know, like that moment in 1984 where they, they, they changed sides and they say, oh, we've always been at war with these states. Oceania's always been our friend. And everybody just goes along with it. That's a novel, and it's a movie. It's not yeah. the way people really work. Yeah, and, and I don't mind, and I don't even blame people because you know Fox News they just pump this stuff all the time. So I don't even blame people when they when they you know feel this sort of way. Because what else would you feel if you were just watching the news? Uh, you know the news that the mainstream media nonsense. Yeah, oh, and but. and so now there there's a backlash in Europe and even here in the United States of America, and it's it's one of the consequences of having your propaganda uh, designed by ad agencies and public relations firms because they're institutionally thinking in very short time spans, and there's no continuity of this alternate reality that propaganda is supposed to create for us. It's lost the narrative to use the, the filmmaking term, and that's why people are turning away from it. It doesn't make sense. For propaganda to work, it has to present an alternate reality that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I was watching this video from Philadelphia. Do you know, you know the cop, uh, the, the guy who shot the cop with the weird mask? Yes. And he was wearing that, like, weird, uh, I guess they were trying to say that, but that's such a weird thing for somebody to be wearing. It's like me dressing up, like, with a sombrero saying that I'm... Hey, I'm Mexican. And doing well, something. remember the guy they had running around in, uh, dressed in Arab robes on New York on 9-11 to sell the idea that this was an Arab uh, attack. Some of it's a little over the top. And, yes, a lot of it is manufactured yeah. propaganda. And it's not very good either. Anyway, listen, right. Jim, well, thanks, we, we, thank you. we got to take a break for our top-of-the-hour news and commercials, and we'll be back with the lovely Lady Claire after these few words. Aloha, America. Welcome back to our show, hour number three. And uh, the phone lines are open, 877-300-7645. George is now sitting in our control room, ready to answer the phone when you call on in. And for those of you watching on BAM user, this gorgeous creature sitting behind me is the lovely Lady Claire, who joins us on Fridays with her unique perspective on the world. But before we turn the mic over to her, story just came in. Apparently, the feeling over at the Davos Summit, where all the money junkies are getting together to talk about how they can be more money junkies. Uh, <clears throat> the wisdom on the uh, conversation seems to be that if Donald Trump is elected president of the United States of America, it will probably be the end of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And there's one more reason to be supporting Donald Trump. So, Claire, what do you want to talk about first? Well, I'd like to talk about uh, Brazil and what is going on there. Sao Paulo police we're deploying tear, tear gas and rubber bullets against transport fair hike protesters. And apparently uh, the protesters refused to wrap up their citywide protest against an increase in transport fares. Dozens were injured, according to social media reports. And officials are yet to produce the official figures for those injured during the Thursday night clashes. But social media users are flooding the web with reports of dozens being injured in the military, police cracked down on protesters. And uh, the crowd was doing fine until they reached Prata de Republica Square, which authorities designated as the end point for the rally, and the people said, I don't think so. And uh, then the authorities started using the tear gas. Well, and this transport increase fare, uh, it doesn't sound to, to people like you and I like it's a big deal. Uh, but it's a significant rate hike yeah. on a population that doesn't have any extra money to be paying increases That's anywhere. Right. That's why they're angry. It's, I mean, it's a cautionary tale. Yes. Because it shows just what will bring people to their breaking point. Absolutely. And this did. Yeah, and this, this was did. it. Uh, I'd like to bop on over now to the Obama administration, which is fighting to keep, quote, unquote, disturbing force-feeding Gitmo footage secret. And, uh, oh yes, our transparency pres pre presidency strikes again. They are pushing ahead with its efforts to keep secret a quote-unquote extremely disturbing tape of a Guantanamo detainee being force-fed. Having missed a federal court's deadline, it has notified a judge that it would again appeal the order. 
And the Department of Justice Deputy Assistant Attorney General General submitted a notice of appeal in the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C. on Thursday. Now, according to The Intercept, the DOJ has until end of today's date to release 11 hours of video material showing Guantanamo guards using what D.C. District Judge Gladys Kessner said was a particularly rough treatment of a Syrian detainee, Abu Wa'el Dab. The footage shows Dab, who was hunger-striking at the time, being p- pulled from his cell and fed against his will by six guards, yes, you heard it right, six guards in riot squad gear, according to Reprieve, the organization that helps Diab in his legal battle against President Obama. And what they're talking about here is mm-hmm. they, they, they literally strapped him into a chair and shoved a tube down his throat with a funnel to pour stuff in. And... Yeah, it's a very disturbing video, uh, but we know the U.S. government has been torturing these people Mm -hmm. to the point where they're willing to starve themselves to death to get out of it. Uh, We know that a lot of these people that are still being held in Guantanamo have been cleared for release by the military tribunal, uh, but the Obama administration is keeping them there because their bodies bear scars of worse things than waterboarding being done to them. Yeah, it's amazing to me that this administration is so frightened of what people will see if these videos of NG2 feeding get released. Now, the way it happens is it's eased through the nose and into the interior of the stomach, and then the fluid is inserted. But even among the best of circumstances when you've got a practitioner in, let's say, the best teaching hospital in the United States. And a patient who isn't fighting back. Yeah, uh, you know, it's still dicey. It's still dicey. It's very hard to do well and effectively. We have known that since the Troubles in Ireland in the 70s, when they were force-feeding hunger strikers. But it must be something pretty awful if this transparent administration does not want us seeing this. And I don't think the the Obama administration understands that the longer they withhold all these videos of the force-feeding and the Mm -hmm. torture, we're free to just use our imaginations uh, and imagine the absolute worst that's being done to these poor people in these uh, CIA torture centers in Guantanamo. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, it, and it's it's a travesty. It's what's being done with your tax dollars. It's and, a war crime. Yeah, and in your name, folks, in your name. Uh, I'd like to kind of bop over to... Uh, bop away. I will bop to Hillary's anti-Sanders letters. Well, apparently, half of the foreign policy experts signing Clinton's anti-Sanders letters have ties to military contractors. Surprise, surprise. Uh, Hillary's camp campaign released a letter this week in which 10 foreign policy experts criticized her opponent Bernie Sanders' call for closer engagement with Iran and said Sanders had, quote-unquote, not thought through these crucial national security issues that can have profound consequences for our security. Now, the letter was widely covered, but what wasn't covered is that fully half of the former State Department officials and ambassadors who signed the letter and who are now backing Clinton, are now enmeshed in the military contracting establishment, which has benefited tremendously from escalating violence around the world, particularly in the Middle East. And right now, I'm going to name and shame. Uh, Former Assistant Defense Secretary Derek Cholette, former Pentagon and CIA Chief of Staff Jeremy Bash, and former Deputy National Security Advisor Julianne Smith, are now employed by the consulting firm Beacon Global Strategies, a firm that uh, was profiled last year. Beacon Global Strategy staff advises both Clinton and Republican candidates for president, including Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. The firm makes money by providing advice to a clientele that is primarily military contractors. Beacon Global Strategies, however, has refused to to disclose the identity of its clients. Uh, The letter was also signed by former Undersecretary of State Nicholas Burns, who is a senior counselor at the Cohen Group, a consulting firm founded by former Defense Secretary William Cohen. The firm assists aerospace and defense firms on policy, business development, and transactions. And uh, apparently also former Undersecretary of Defense Jim Miller is an advisory board member to Endgame Systems, a startup that has been called the Blackwater of Hacking. Miller is also on the board of BEI Precision Systems in Space, a military contractor. Well, imagine my surprise. Well, I think Hillary is making a major strategic mistake 
uh, uh, attacking Sanders for not being enough of a war hawk yeah. when you're dealing with an American people who are sick and tired of all the war. We've mm-hmm. been at war in Iraq for 25 years, a quarter of a century, yeah. longer than Claire and my marriage. We've been at war in Iraq, and the American people mm-hmm. are sick and tired of it. They're sick and tired of paying for it. They're sick and tired of seeing their children come back from the war zone in wheelchairs or metal boxes. Yeah. And I, I think the more Hillary tries to attack Bernie Sanders on his lack of enthusiasm for more bloodshed, mm-hmm. uh, I think it's going to work in Bernie Sanders' uh, favor. And, and let me share something, Mike. Uh, with the Iranian Constitution of 79, I, as a Christian can go to an English-speaking Christian church. Christianity and Judaism are protected minority religions in Iran. Not so in Saudi Arabia. I, You know, if I had the choice between Riyadh and uh, Tehran, I would take Tehran any day. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but, it, but, of course, the religion and sex, those are not the issues. No. Iran refuses to accept private central banking. They're selling their oil for currencies other than the dollar. Mm-hmm. And uh, Israel wants them balkanized uh, so that Israel can continue to dominate the region. We're mm-hmm. coming up here on a first commercial break. And when we come on back, we're going to be talking with more of the Lady Claire's talking points. So stay tuned. We'll be back after these words from our sponsors. And Aloha America, welcome back to the show. And of course, that bump music is one of the many creations of the lovely Lady Claire. What's the next topic you want to mention? Well, this has to come from the U.S. government's department of you can't make this stuff up. The FBI is stating that encryption is preventing it from solving the San Bernardino shooting. And the FBI says its investigation into the San Bernardino shooting has been stymied by <gasps> encryption. I thought they'd already solved it. There were these three tall, (laughs) white, athletic males, and they mutated into these two brown-skinned people. Right, right, right. Who were handcuffed when shot dead by the police. And in in addition to not finding a computer hard drive allegedly used by the suspects, the FBI can't break the encryption code protecting two cell phones, according to David Budich, assistant director in charge of the FBI Los Angeles field office. As to those devices, obviously, we've said from day one, the digital footprint is extremely important for us to hopefully learn about any contacts, contacts, and ultimately any intent on their part, but which told Fox News. Well, I thought the NSA was tracking everybody's metadata so they can build a contact map out of that. You don't suppose this is just more propagandizing to try and get a ban on encryption by the U.S. government? Well, all I can say is, oh, poor little FBI cryptographers are impotent. Well, they I are. Use any... that word advisedly, folks. Well, to do this. Here, here, here's the point. First of yeah. all, even the head of the NSA has now come out and acknowledged that mm-hmm. American citizens do have a legitimate need for strong encryption to protect their business mm-hmm. secrets and so forth. But again, as we pointed out with our NSA challenges. Anybody with a little bit of programming experience can come up with new systems of encryption that the FBI and NSA are not going to break. And taking strong encryption away from ordinary citizens, it's just like taking guns away from ordinary citizens. It makes us more helpless. More vulnerable. And and it's not going to stop the real criminals and terrorists one itty-bitty tiny bit. They've already got it big time, you know. I mean, hello. I mean, they can get their guns from Fast and Furious. (laughs) And I'm sure the the criminals and terrorists, they're going to find somebody over at the NSA willing to write them up a new system of encryption, you know, in exchange for whatever it is they're bartering. Yeah. It's not that hard to do. That was the whole point of the exercise we did. It's very easy to mm-hmm. defeat the NSA yeah. cryptographically. And then I'd like to bop over to Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, these are countries separated by more than a 1,000 miles. And although they both exist in what is now known as the Greater Middle East, They had little in common, at least until March of 2003, when the Bush administration followed up its 2001 invasion of Afghanistan by invading Iraq. Uh, Since then, they've had quite a lot in common, including vast infusions of U.S. funds and the massive level of corruption that accompany them, as well as the way war refugees from both countries have been joining the same flow of the desperate dispossessed heading for Europe. These days, with the spread of an Islamic State franchise to Afghanistan, even their insurgents are becoming part of the same brand. And the other thing they've got in common, they've become ghosts. In both countries, the U.S. military has built, on paper, vast local security forces from scratch to the tune of at least $65 billion in Afghanistan and at least $25 billion in Iraq. 
Their armies and police forces, however, have turned out to be remarkably spectral in nature. They are filled with ghost soldiers and ghost policemen who are paid salaries but don't really exist. In some cases, they're quite literally already dead and wandering the world of spirits. I'm just wondering where all that <laughs> money is going and why we yeah. can't get a little tiny bit of it yeah. so that the people of Flint, Michigan can have safe drinking water. Yeah. Their U.S.-funded salaries are in turn being pocketed by commanders and other military officials in an operation that couldn't be more profitable or successful, at least until their ranks, sometimes spin to non-existence, are attacked by flesh-and-blood enemy forces. In Iraq in 2014, after significant parts of the country's American-built army had abandoned its weaponry and fled its posts in the country's northern cities in the face of modest numbers of Islamic State fighters, the Prime Minister announced that there were at least 50,000 ghost troops in his military, which are believed to be an absolute understatement. And ghost soldiers win wars only in the Lord of the Rings, not yes. the real world. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> I'm laughing, but guys, sometimes it's hard to stop. I'm so sorry. Apparently, for the Pentagon, failure is an option. And yet they don't seem to recognize that doing the same doggone thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome outcome is a classical definition of insanity. Well, I think it's insane to go into this approach that money wins wars. Yes. Just if you fling enough money, you will prevail. And mm -hmm. it is a common thought in the Pentagon, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in the weapons procurement uh, division, but uh, it, it really doesn't work, in part because all of these training programs are training the Afghanis and the Iraqis to kill their own countrymen. And that's mm -hmm. a tough sell. Yeah. That's a very tough sell. Very definitely. And uh, I can sort of understand if I'd been trained to kill my own countrymen that there might be a point where morally I just couldn't and I'd hang up my rifle and say, the heck with this. Same, same here. I yeah. mean, I, I can only think of maybe one or two of my fellow countrymen I'd be willing to kill. <laughs> <laughs> That's only hypothetical, dear. But they, only need, a, they need killing. It's only they a need dirty killing. rumor. They, they absolutely need killing. And okay. to, uh, to go back <clears throat> to Afghanistan... The Pentagon has now been given broad authority to target ISIS in Afghanistan. And apparently they are establishing themselves in the southeastern portion of the country, the city of Jalalabad. Where and, the oil is. Yes. The Pentagon, how interesting, how ironic. And the Pentagon reportedly has been given broad new authority to launch attacks on ISIS targets in the country. Previously, the U.S. forces in Afghanistan were limited to attacking ISIS targets in that country only when they met a specific criteria, such as being threats to the troops on the ground. The new rules haven't been made public, but are said to allow them to attack any terrorist group in Afghanistan, including ISIS. And it's probably going to be about as wonderful as it is down in Syria, where yep. they're bombing food storage facilities and water supplies and power stations. Mm -hmm. You know, terrorists drink water, so we've got to destroy the water supply for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm looking at the, the amount of time that we have been in Afghanistan, for all the blood and money spent. And, Michael, I cannot wrap my hands around the reality that there is no possible military metric that can be characterized as a success here. Well, none of these wars that yeah. started back 14 years ago can be called a success because we were told these wars were to punish the perpetrators of 9-11, Mm -hmm. and to get rid of Saddam's nuclear weapons, which, and, and yeah. to punish Saddam for aligning with al-Qaeda, all of which turned out to be complete fiction. So under the justifications for war we were given, victory is impossible. We can't accomplish the things we were being told they were trying to accomplish, and as it has turned out, we're not even accomplishing the covert reasons for the war. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a quagmire. <clears throat> We've been in Afghanistan 14 years. We've been in Iraq 25 years. Yeah. Enough is enough is enough is enough. We've got to take a break for commercials, and we'll be right back. And Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here. And before we go back to the Lady Claire, we're going to take a phone call from Mike in Vermont. Aloha, Mike. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hey, Mike. First of all, I want to tell you, I really appreciate your show. Thank you. Uh, I've been following you for years and years. Mm hmm but I want to bring up a point that I have uh, come across recently. I don't know if you know who this uh, Deagle.com is, which apparently is a uh, statistical contractor for the De Department of Defense. I'm not familiar with them, no. Yeah, I know, and you might want to be. Um, so I'm reading this right now. Uh, I got this up in front of me. Hello, are you there? 
Hello, Mike. The United States at this time is 319 million. And this is through, uh, they do, like I say, statisticals for the Department of Defense. Okay, Mike, with the, Mike, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt, but we lost you momentarily. I need you to go back and repeat uh, that sentence after. I'm looking at this here, and then you cut out until we got to the 300 million, so we don't know what the context okay. is. All right. So I'm looking at the uh, population of the United States yes. on this uh, uh, it's a DOD statistical contractor. And what they do is statistics for the United States. And I'm looking at the population of the United States, and it says it's basically 319 million. And it gives a list of the currency, the, you know, the years, the density of population, the GDP, the budget, the military budget, the imports amount, the exports amount, and then it gives a forecast for 2025. Okay. And this is a, a forecast, of course. And you go down and it gives a forecast of the population density, gross domestic product, you know, purchase power, military budget, and all that. So I'm looking at this, and it goes population. So the population today, or 2015, is 319 million. Population in 2025 for the United States is 65 million. Now, that is a very interesting drop in number. And, yes, uh, it is. <clears throat> do and they... also, also, so is the density of people per square kilometer. Also, the drop in the gross domestic product, the GDP is a drop, the purchase power. Okay, what was the name of that website again, please? Yeah, you really got to look at this. Uh, you really got to look at this, Michael. It's Deagle, D-E-A-G-E-L dot com, which is backslash country. And then if you wanted to go further, it would be backslash United States. But uh, so I go to the uh, chart below. It gives you a uh, a chart down here, and it starts at 1993 and goes up to uh, 2020. So in, uh, it gives you this chart, and it goes to 2016, 17. Okay. Oh, 20. yeah. Um, you really got to look at this thing. Uh, I am looking at this thing right now. Anyway, listen, thank you for the information. I'm going to look into this and see what it's uh, saying. Uh, yeah, you really got to look into that. Yeah, that, that drop? That's yeah scary. Th th that is very scary. Anyway, Mike, thank Somebody you. Somebody knows something that we don't know. <laughs> well, maybe that swine anyway. flu over in Russia is going to get out of control. Thanks a lot, Mike. We're going to let you go, and we're going to go ahead and close the phone lines for the remainder of the show. And, uh, Claire, what is your next topic? The next topic is, guess who is going to be speaking to members of the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish American Organizations in New York? I have no idea. May I have a drum roll, please? Jonathan Pollard. Yes, they're turning him into a hero, and it's, it's shameful what this guy did to the United States mm -hmm. and how he was... Israel says he's our guy, he's our hero, we want him, he's been paroled, and at some point in the future they're going to take him to Israel. And he's a hero to them for betraying the United States of America. Yeah, and also participating in the meeting will be Representatives Jerry Nadler and Elliot Engel, both Jewish New York Democrats, who have been involved in efforts to secure Pollard's release and to improve his terms of parole. They wrote a letter to Attorney General Loretta Lynch last November asking her to intervene to ensure Pollard receives fair and equal treatment once released on parole. Now, in an unusual move, the Conference of Presidents informed member organizations of the event with Pollard by phone instead of the usual email exchange usually used to communicate with members. One official speculated that this was done in hopes of preventing news of the meeting being leaked, a tactic that failed. Now, what is the old line, you are judged by the company you keep? Well, apparently, this Conference of Presidents of Jewish American Organizations is perfectly happy 
welcoming Jonathan Pollard to their bosom. A they, they think to he's a hero. Country. They think he's a hero. Absolutely. And for those who have uh, not been paying attention about the Pollard issue, Jonathan Pollard stole secrets from the United States of America, and he sold them to Israel, including nuclear missile targeting information. And this was back in the day where missile targeting had to be set with a box of tools at the rocket. They couldn't just do it through the computer. It was a big deal to change. And he got this information and he sold it to Israel. Israel traded it to the Soviet Union in exchange for increased emigration quotas of Jews leaving Russia, coming to Israel. Had the U.S. gone to nuclear war with Russia at that moment, the United States would have lost. That's the depth of this guy's betrayal. He should have mm-hmm. been treated just like Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. He's strapped into an electric chair and electrocuted, uh, electrocuted uh, twice like they had to do to Ethel. And instead, he, you, know, he's, you know, he's now going to be a hero. He's been hanging out with Bernie Madoff, you know, playing canasta over there at your taxpayer expense. And it is a shameful example mm-hmm. of how the U.S. is just treating Israel so gently. And it's not just Jonathan Pollard. Look at those Mossad agents who were arrested for cheering and high-fiving on 9-11 when those towers came crashing down and all those thousands of people were dying. And the U.S. kept them quiet and then quietly sent them back to Israel. And once they were in Israel, they were stars on TV. And they were admitting they were there to document the event. And three of them were known Mossad agents. Yeah. But probably for this organization, betrayal of the United States is no big thing. If it benefits Israel. Well, that, and, and again, I'm yeah. hoping in this election season, along with a, an obvious building anti-incumbency fever, I think it's time that we start looking at this friend of Israel aspect here. Because no government can serve two masters, and a government that serves Israel does not serve the United States of America. Mm-hmm. We need a government that's going to put America first, second, and third. Before we go to the commercial break, though, I'm looking at the Steagle website, and I think Mike in Vermont uh, may have misinterpreted what he was seeing because the forecast for 2025 is the American population will decline by 65 million, which is still significant, but it's not saying the total population will be 65 million. Uh, Still, though, uh, that is rather interesting, especially with all the illegal immigrants and refugees pouring in, why they think there's going to be uh, that kind of a significant uh, drop in population. Uh, But... uh uh, they they definitely uh, definitely are looking at uh, yeah these these are decline numbers not final numbers but still it shows the United States is in decline uh, just like the New York Times said our best days are behind us America is a failing empire and anybody who says otherwise they're they're, they're dreaming the the problems with this country can't be fixed by the current government we're just going to have to wait for them to fall down flop around and restart the country. Then things will get better. We'll be back after these words from our sponsors. Hello, hi, America. Welcome back to the show here. <clears throat> and I'm looking at uh, this Deagle.com website. And actually, as of right now, uh, it just stopped working. I posted it to WhatReallyHappened.com. And I'm still going through the numbers here. But what's really interesting is there is the page where all the countries are listed. And as of 2014, the U.S. was number one. When you hit the prediction button for 2025, the U.S. is way down the list. So this... Deagle.com, whoever they are and what they're doing, uh, seems to have a very pessimistic view of uh, the future. I got an email saying that this uh, is not a government website. Uh, it may be somebody's, you know, we may have to, we may be dealing with somebody's fantasy here uh, because there's no foundation uh, for uh, what they're saying. Anyway, Claire, your next message is? Well, I'd like to report on what is going on in Syria and to sum it up in two words. It's on. Russia has begun ground operations in Syria. Citing a Kuwaiti daily, the Jerusalem Post is reporting that Russia has begun ground operations in Syria and is helping to hold recent territorial gains made by Syria's armies against the so-called moderate rebels. Yes, that includes ISIS. And one U.S. official said seven Russian T-90 tanks were observed at the airfield near Latakia, a stronghold of Syrian President Bashar Assad. The Kuwaiti report adds that the Russian forces have already taken over multiple strategic positions and have forced numerous rebel battalions to retreat. And this was also confirmed by Iran's state-controlled Fars News Agency, reporting this as well. And they're setting up operations at an airfield in a northeastern, mostly Kurdish province, 
across the country from its main coastal base. In an adjacent province, locals said that the United States is intensifying its aid to Kurdish militias, even taking over a small agricultural airport. Pentagon officials have denied this. And some Syrian fighters say Russia has reached out to Sunni tribes, offering to help them fight the Islamic State extremist group in the east after similar American efforts failed. And amid the rising tensions between Ankara and Moscow, Turkish President Erdogan has expressed concern over the alleged presence of Russian engineers near the country's Syrian border. And today he raised the alarm and said, we have said this from the beginning. We won't tolerate such formations in northern Syria along the area stretching from the Iraqi border up to the Mediterranean, he told reporters. We maintain there there are sensitivities on these issues and is planning to talk about them with U.S. VP Joe Biden tomorrow, I believe, at Davos. And then to add to what's going on here, Turkey has invaded Syria. This comes from globalresearch.com, which is usually pretty straightforward. The Syrian government has formally appealed to the U.N. over incursions into its territory by Turkish troops. The protest at the U.N. came amid reports that rebel soldiers have crossed the border and entered the Syrian town of Jurablus in the western bank of the Euphrates River. Uh, Turkish military action inside Syria threatens to escalate the internal conflict in that country and increase the threat of a confrontation between Turkey, Russia, and the United States. Right now, Jarablus is under the control of the Islamic State of Iran and ISIS, I, and Syria, ISIS, but has come under increasing pressure from the Syrian Kurdish People's Protection Units, which have been receiving backing from Washington uh, <clears throat> in its so-called war on ISIS. Mm-hmm. Now, Turkey is a NATO nation, supposedly a part of the anti-ISIS coalition, but there is extensive evidence that the government of uh, Erdogan has facilitated the flow of fighters, arms, and money to the Islamic militants and tacitly sanctioned the smuggling into Turkey of oil produced by ISIS-controlled installations in Syria. They're stealing Syria's oil, yeah. and, and Turkey is fencing it. Yeah. Erdogan's son is caught yeah. up in all of that. And also, uh, apparently, Americans are setting up bases in Syrian Kurdistan. It's getting a little crowded over there. Yeah, you know, and apparently by the nearby Hasaka province, the Americans have reportedly taken control of the former Syrian military Remelian airfield. They are apparently seeking to use it as a hub to give closer support to Kurdish People's Protection Units, YPG, fighters in Syria engaged against ISIS. And as far as we know, Damascus has not authorized the U.S. to be using no. Syrian airfields here. No. So, you know, it's on. I don't know what kind of the odds Vegas is giving right now of people getting into a mix and getting into a fight between the Kurds and the Turks and the U.S. and, US and Syrian forces. But, Mike, this is a recipe for absolute global disaster. Well, it's, the, the opportunities for chaos are there. Yeah. Uh, there was one report that... Um, uh, Turkey, as, as part of its operations, going after the Kurds, had shot down two U.S. Marine helicopters. That's been denied. Mm-hmm. There was another report that Syria had downed another Russian fighter. Russia is saying, no, that didn't happen either. But when you have all these different uncoordinated forces in that same area, yeah. the possibility for an accident uh, is, is very, very much real. Very huge. Okay, do you have something short here? Yes, I do. Okay. Let's go back to, I cannot begin to express enough, Um, sadness about the people of Flint. The governor of the state knew about the Flint water poisoning for nearly a year and tried to shift blame. Redacted emails released Wednesday Wednesday by Michigan Governor Rick Snyder show that his administration was informed of problems with Flint's water almost a year ago, many months before the embattled governor or his staff begrudgingly admitted to bearing any responsibility for poisoning a city or fixing the problem. Now, here's the question you need to ask. Yeah. If it happened in Flint, yep. where else is it going on right now? Yeah. We're, we're seeing the effects of neglected infrastructure all mm-hmm. over the country because all of our wealth has been poured all over Wall Street, Israel, and these endless wars, quarter of a century of wars now. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're seeing it. Uh, you've got the Porter Ranch gas leak. You've got the whip radiation leak, Hanford, 
Gulf oil disaster, all of this is because the infrastructure that we built up to support our nation is starting to crumble and fall apart, and nobody has the resources to fix it. The government of Flint, the government of Michigan, knew the people were drinking dangerously toxic water contaminated with lead, and they went along with it because it saved them a few bucks on their budget. And lead poisoning is irreversible. What I want to see happen, Mike, to every person who signed off on this, prosecuted to the full extent of the law, and hard jail time so it doesn't happen again. Send them down to Guantanamo and have them uh, force drinking that leaded water. You know, <laughs> the, I mean, yeah, you know, it, it just, it, it, as someone who loves kids and wants to see all kids reach their potential, the idea of a mother sitting there with the doctor saying, I'm sorry, but, you know, Jane has this unacceptable level of lead in her system, and she's going to have terrible problems throughout all of her life. She's and there's never going nothing to be able to... you can do about yeah, it. Yeah, there's nothing we can do. And even setting aside the human cost, Yeah. okay, the lead in the water is being leached out of the water pipes themselves, and that means the pipes are decaying. Yeah. And that means somewhere down the road they're going to fail and have to be replaced. Mm -hmm. So this, this was a penny-wise and pound-foolish decision by the Flint and Michigan government. They just wanted to save a few bucks on the budget now, even though somewhere down the road somebody's going to have to pick up the cost for major renovations and improvements to the water system that mm -hmm. otherwise would not have been necessary. Right. Right. And they, they knew they were tapping into a polluted river for the water. Yeah, that, when, that when was not unknown. Yeah, yeah that, that just... Okay. All right, we have only uh, a minute or so left in the mm -hmm. show, and I got an email uh, asking us to just mention some common sense things. If you're in the path of that snowstorm, do not take any chances. Mm -hmm. This one is going to be wicked. It's not just the snow. It's the very high levels of wind and wind chill. Mm -hmm. Do not take any chances at all. You know, stay in your home, stay warm. Uh, hopefully you've gone to the store and you've gotten, uh, you know, uh, food that doesn't require refrigeration. Yeah. Because you're probably going to lose your electricity. Right. And just stay warm and stay protected. Mm -hmm. Don't be daring and say, ah, oh, the heck with the weather, I'm going on down to the, to the you know, don't yeah. do that. That's how people die. Yeah. And, and uh, it, take this one seriously. Don't believe that Al Gore nonsense that snow is now a thing of the past. This is a really bad storm, and a lot of people are going to be suffering. Please take care of yourselves. All right, Absolutely. there's the music time. It's Pow Hana Friday. Time for Claire and I to get on out of here and run errands and work on her new computer and all the rest <laughs> of that. So have a really good weekend. We'll be back on Monday. Take care, everyone. Here on the Genesis Communication Network. Until then, aloha, America. Ooh.